praying for. Thank you, Josh. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You're going to see that we're picking up where uh, we left off with our congregational responsive reading today. As I was thinking and praying earlier in the week uh, about this time, this first observance of the Lord's Supper for 2017, it, uh, I was struck or was reminded that I don't know that in the 11 plus years I've been here that we've ever just stopped and considered Lord's Supper preparation. We've talked about it, we've, we've exhorted one another, admonished one another, be sure you make preparation for the Lord's Supper. But I thought it would be good today to set the tone for this year and our Lord's Supper celebrations and observances this year to look at this passage together this morning. If you would, I uh, hope you found in your Bibles 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 to 34. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, we'll put the text on the screen. But as always, we want you to have your own copy of Scripture. Stand with me if you would and follow along in your Bibles as I read this passage. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are dis disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God, and it teaches us very practically how to approach this memorial meal, the Lord's Supper. I pray that our hearts will be prepared when we come to the table in a few moments. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, it's good to remind yourself, to remind one another why we come and what, what we are doing when we have the Lord's Supper. It's called by various things, uh, Holy Communion, the Eucharist. Uh, they all are descriptives of this ordinance that Jesus left. He left us two ordinances. Uh, uh, the Puritans and some of our early Baptist fathers would say three ordinances. Um, Baptists would say believers' baptism by immersion and then the celebration of the Lord's Supper and then the practice of corrective church discipline. That's the third ordinance that you'll find if you ever read about these things. What is the Lord's Supper? Well, look, I would encourage you to go to our Confession of Faith. The Baptist Confession of 1689, we've adopted that as a church. It says on the Lord's Supper that the Lord's Supper was instituted by the Lord on the same night in which he was betrayed. It's to be observed in his churches to the world's end for a perpetual remembrance of him and to show forth the sacrifice of, his, of himself in his death. It was instituted also to confirm saints in the belief that all the benefits stemming from Christ's sacrifice belong to them. Furthermore, it is meant to promote their spiritual nourishment and growth in Christ and to strengthen the ties that bind them to all the duties they owe to him. The Lord's Supper is also a bond and a pledge of the fellowship which believers have with Christ and with one another. The confession goes on to say, those who as worthy participants outwardly eat and drink the visible bread and wine in this ordinance at the same time receive and feed upon Christ crucified and receive all the benefits accruing from his death. This they do really and indeed, not as if feeding upon the actual flesh and blood of a person's body, but inwardly and by faith. In the supper, the body and blood of Christ represent are, are, are present to the faith of believers, not in an actual physical way, but in a way of spiritual apprehension, just as the bread and wine themselves are present to their outward physical senses. So in, in summary, you, you see that 
This Lord's Supper is a remembrance of Jesus. Luke 22, 19 records, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It is also our communion with him. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, earlier in this book of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? It's a symbolic representation of our communion with him. Also, it's our fellowship with the body of Christ, and then especially the local body. 1 Corinthians 11, 18 For in the first place, when you come together as a church, we read this responsively earlier, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. And then he says in verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. If it's it's done right, if preparation is made, then it becomes a, a focal point for us to be sure that we are in unity and in harmony with one another. It's also a commemoration of the death of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 26. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what I want us to see for just a few minutes this morning before we actually celebrate the Lord's Supper. Four things out of this passage I read to you. First, it's a sober warning concerning the Lord's Supper. Secondly, a serious exhortation to prepare for the Lord's Supper. Third, a sincere promise of God's judgment for those who, uh, who misappropriate this ordinance. And then fourth, self-discipline versus God's discipline. That's the warning that comes there virtually. Look at, this, look at the first thing, a sober warning concerning the Lord's Supper. Verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So we, we mark immediately that there is a worthy manner and an unworthy manner. We have to ask ourselves, so as I approach the Lord's Supper today, do I approach it in the, in the worthy manner or an unworthy manner? Uh, to do so unworthily, and remember, we're not talking about b- may, making yourself worthy. Uh, grace is what, and our receiving of grace is what opens this precious ordinance to us. But as recipients of grace... How are we conducting ourselves in, in living for Jesus Christ? And we're going to look in, in a few minutes at focus specifically on examination. But it begs the question, doesn't it? Lord, as I come to the table today, help me by your spirit and the light of the gospel to do so in a worthy manner and not unworthy because I do not want to be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. You've declared me not guilty. You've justified me by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Not for anything I've done, but simply for what Jesus Christ has done. And my childlike faith, focused and fixed upon him as a recipient of righteousness. Secondly, there's a serious exhortation to prepare for the Lord's Supper. Verse 28, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, it's got to be recognized, we live in a day when self-examination is taboo. The notion that you would stop and contemplate, I don't, by the way, I don't know how you, how you found week one out of the chute with this Bell's uh, challenge. Uh, to bless three people this week, to eat with three people this week, to, to listen uh, to the Spirit, begin, begin to practice silence and solitude, uh, to, to learn of Christ, immerse yourself more in the Gospels, and then to live as one sent. Uh, these are habits, by the way. You know, there's nobody, if, if you've got them all, if you've mastered them all uh, this week, then see me afterwards. I want to let you do some teaching, and I want to learn. I, I, meditating, examination, boy, it's, that's not, it's not doesn't come natural. It doesn't, doesn't grow on Adam's vine. Yet the scripture calls us to examine ourselves. Paul says in another place, examine yourself whether or not you're in the faith. And, and so here in this preparation for the Lord's Supper, he says, let a person examine himself. Well, how do we do that? Well, uh, Matthew Henry has a great uh, book on the, the communicant's companion, I think, where he spells out preparation for the Lord's Supper. There's another one that I came across, Thomas Highweiss. 
on the communicant spiritual companion. And he, he suggests four aspects of examination. I just want to point these out. Examine your repentance, he says. Consider whether you have really repented of your former sins and purpose to lead a new life. You can help determine repentance by considering whether you have a sorrow for sin, a hatred of sin, a general forsaking of sin, and whether there are clear evidences of change in your heart and life. Have you confessed known sin? Are you genuinely sorry for how your sin has offended God? Is there evidence that God has been transforming you by his power? Examine your repentance. Children, we've said for years, repentance goes way beyond, I'm sorry. Sorry. That's not repentance. But we adults need to learn that too. That's not just something that afflicts children. Examine your repentance. Examine your faith, secondly. Consider whether you have a dead faith or a living faith, if the book of James should come to mind, a mere speculative assent to the truth or a lively, genuine, energetic trust in God. This is the kind of faith that directs you to Christ as your propitiation, that is your, your, your sin-bearing, wrath-appeasing sacrifice. And that lays hold of his strength as the only power that can cleanse and pardon you. Where's your trust? How often are you pondering the great truths of the gospel? So examine your faith. Third, examine your gratitude. Consider whether you are thankful for the precious privileges which are yours in Christ. If you're aware of the depth of your sin and the heights of God's mercy, you must be filled with gratitude. Are you quick to give thanks when you pray? Are you quick to give thanks to God for his grace and mercy? Do you thank God for his most precious gift of his son? Is it gratitude or is it grumbling? What, what marks your life? Examine your gratitude. And then fourth, examine your love. Consider whether you are in charity with all men. This is a, an old uh, use of the term. In other words, are you, are you charitable? Are you kind toward all? The Christian faith is a faith of love toward God that works itself out in love for one another. You ought to hear in that the great commandment, and you ought to hear in that our purpose statement. Love God and love others. Are you harboring hatred or ill will toward another person? Are you expressing love in acts of kindness and charity? Are you especially showing love to fellow believers? Examine yourself. There's that call to do that. And we should do that as a part and parcel of our lives. But the regular celebration of the Lord's Supper brings us back to that in case we have gone astray and forgotten to, to examine yourself. Third, there's this sincere promise of God's judgment. He says in verse 29 and 30, If anyone eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now you read commentators who are going to say, well, without discerning the body means that she gives the body of Christ here, that, that without, without really contemplating and understanding that, that you're remembering his death, and in remembering his death, burial and resurrection, it must call you to, am, am I reflecting that? Am I, am I living for Christ? And I think that's possible here, but it, but it may be speaking because he's chided them already about the way they act with one another. By the way, Lord willing, when we finish the Gospel of Mark, we're going to, I think, go into 1 Corinthians, a perfect gospel for an imperfect church. He, he, he admonishes the Corinthians throughout that letter for problems they had. He may well be saying... You're not discerning that this meal brings you together as a body. You're, you're thinking as an individualist. You're, you're thinking high-mindedly. You're not, this is not provoking in you a servant spirit thinking more highly of others than you do of yourself. If you're not discerning the body, if, if, you're, if you're a disruptor in the body, what he's saying is, God's going to take you out of the body. That's why he says, that's why many of you are weak and ill. And some have died. Now granted, people have abused this notion. You've heard it. We're in the, we're in the, 
we're in the mecca of it here in this in this part of the country, where God doesn't want you to be sick, and and if you're sick, you need to confess sin, and and well, that doesn't bear out under Scripture. But folks, the fact that that's not true doesn't mean that we better not deal with this. We need to deal with this. That's why many of you are weak and ill. Paul is writing to a church here. The church of Corinth, and he says, you know how you can explain the weakness of the afflictions of some? In fact, he says many here. And some have died. You know how you can explain the death? Don't forget, folks, early on in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira were killed by the Holy Spirit because they brought an attitude that would taint the gospel-centeredness, the gospel-compassion of that church. Paul says, God, God's going to judge you. John talks about in 1 John that there's a sin that leads to death. He says, if you see someone committing the sin that leads to death, I don't, don't pray for them. What he's basically saying, this is my paraphrase, is back away. There is a sin that leads to death, John says. We need to take this very seriously. I stayed in a situation in a church I served through tumultuous times to watch God kill people. There was a preacher that came in in the midst of all that. I don't want to chase this rabbit too far, but... but it sent shivers up my spine when he would sing. He said, the work that God is doing here, this work of reformation, he said, it's so evidently of God that if you resist it, God will kill you. Do you hear me? When he said that, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I, two things I thought, wow, that's intense. And I thought, when you're gone, I'm going to have to deal with that because people are going to just believe that I put you up to it. And look, it scared me as much as it scared them. But I saw it happen. There's a woman who preached on 1 Corinthians 13 one Sunday on the love chapter. She walked out and said to her sister in my hearing, so she said, if that's the way that he's going to preach, I'll never come back here. Next, the next week, we wheeled her in, in a coffin. Paul says, God judges. You see, the Lord loves his church more than we do. And this preparation for the Lord's Supper is an occasion for us to, to get focused in, examine our hearts, say, Lord, I don't want there to be anything between me and somebody in this body. I, don't, I, want, I want to clear the accounts. I, want, I don't want to come and, and disparage this meal, which, which was the death of Jesus Christ, to bring us together to make of the two. Ephesians says, one new man of the two. Lord, don't let me be that disruptor. Don't let me be that person. And then fourth, Self-discipline versus God's discipline. Verses 31 to 34, he simply says, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. He says, Here, here's the way that you, that you address that, that you address this, this illness and weakness and even, even death in the congregation because of disobedience to God. We judge ourselves. There's, you see, we have the option here, folks, as Christians, to be practicing self-discipline or to say, well, I'll just let God sort it out. I had a woman say to me years ago, when we were talking about some, some attitudes there, and she said, I'll take my chances with God. I told her, I said, ma'am, I'm not taking chances with God. If I'm in sin, I want to know it now. If I need to repent, I want to know it now. I want to practice it. I want to act upon it. Self-examination, self-discipline. He says, but when we are judged by the Lord, in other words, if we're not going to judge ourselves, if we're not going to use the standard of Scripture and commit to, to live lives that reflect the Scripture imperfectly, not perfectly, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Well, when we're judged by the Lord, because that's the option, either discipline ourselves or be disciplined by the Lord, because whom the Lord loves, he does what? He disciplines. We are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Yes, I've said to people, I know people right now, who profess to be Christians, who are living so contrary to the gospel that I have lovingly sent a warning and said, if you're not careful, 
God will kill you. He will take you out of this world rather than let you continue to live and besmirch the name of Jesus. The difficult thing is that we don't have the, we don't have the discerning eyes of the Holy Spirit to know that when that happens, did, did that happen because that person was a believer or did it happen as, as judgment upon an unbeliever? We won't know that until we get to heaven. But that's the deal. You and I don't have to understand that in the lives of others. We need to take that and say, what about me, Lord? He disciplines us, notice, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. In other words, so, so that you, you may not be cast into hell like the, the world, those, the world of unbelievers will be cast into hell. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, we would, we would rewrite this a little bit. If anyone's hungry, wait till the fellowship meal after, you know, the, the picture here, you, and you may not appreciate it, but the picture would be when we're passing the plate, if somebody looks and says, but I'm, I'm kind of hungry, and just scoops up all the little wafers. Now that seems silly to us, but I mean, that's what, that's what they were dealing with, people that had not eaten. And when the, when the loaf is passed, just break the loaf and take a little bit and pass it on the next person and save... No, he says, eat somewhere else. That's, this, this is not about filling your belly. It's about ministering to you spiritually. When you come together, eat. if anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. When you come together, it will not be for judgment. In other words, the way that you carry on at the Lord's table will not result in God judging you. Then he says there are other things, and that's what we're going to look at, Lord willing, when we enter into a study of 1 Corinthians in the coming weeks, a perfect gospel for an imperfect church. So, in the light of that, then how do we how do we take the Lord's Supper? Well, let me ask you: Are you presently repenting of your sin and trusting Christ for salvation? People scare me who say, "Oh yeah, look, I repented." You repented? You're not continually repenting, brothers and sisters. I'm repenting all the time. I repented this week that my mind my mind races so much. But for me to disentangle and engage in silence and solitude is, is hard. And I've been repenting to God for that. Lord, help me. Help me do it. Take. See, it's not sinful thoughts, but to take every thought captive. To subdue it to Christ. Have I followed Jesus in believer's baptism by immersion? Am I demonstrating by my life a practical unity with the local church? In other words, am I in love with my local church? Because Jesus loves the church. Have I exercised my responsibility to heal broken relationships with other members of the body? Why should we come to the table? Well, he commands it. And when he commands, he gives this promise. So that when we see the elements displayed, we see with our eyes the bread broken and the cup given, I can know for a certain that Christ became real, a real human being, poured out his blood on the cross. These symbols are powerful. Have you thought about it, that, that all the sensory engagements that take place when you take the Lord's Supper? Taste, touch, smell, sight, they're engaged in this powerful symbol. Sure as I take the bread and cup my hand in my hand and taste them with my mouth, I know for certain that Christ nourishes and refreshes my soul with his crucified body and blood. What does it mean for me to accept to eat and drink? It means that I accept with a believing heart the entire suffering and death of Christ for me. It means that, that by believing I'm forgiven all my sins and now have eternal life. Eating and drink, drinking doesn't wash away your sins. Only Christ can do that. This reminds us that he has. Well, what benefits do I receive? Well, my sins are exposed for what they really are before a holy God when I examine myself, when I get honest with God. My heart's inflamed with love for Christ. I'm reminded of all that he suffered for me. My faith in Christ is strengthened. I, I not only hear with my ears what he's done, but I can see, smell, taste, and touch the tokens of his suffering and death on my behalf. One day I will live with Christ. That hope is made more certain. Although his resurrection bodies in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and I'm still here on this earth, the Lord's Supper reinforces his promise 
that he will one day raise my mortal body and take me home to heaven to be with him. What if I'm keenly aware of my imperfections? That's a good thing. He doesn't require you to be perfect to come to the table. He simply requires you to trust in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That great hymn we sing, Come you sinners poor and needy. Let not conscience make you linger, nor a fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requires is to feel your need of him. And that, that feeling, that felt need of him, this he gives you. It even comes from him. It's the Spirit's rising me. So, just for a moment, while our men come to sit at the, on the front pew, bow your heads, prepare your hearts, your minds, to celebrate, to observe the Lord's Supper.